it is impossible to show the correct relative proportions of an atom on this screen. For example, if an atom could be as large as the United States, one of its electrons would be only about 100 feet across. Therefore, to tell our story, we must resort to a symbol. The English chemist Michael Faraday was famous for his work on electromagnetism and electrochemistry, not to mention his fascinating discovery of benzene. Make sure to check out my video on that for the full story. Since he could cause reactions to happen using electric fields, as in electrolysis, and induce electric currents from chemical reactions, as in voltaic cells, this implied that electric charges were a significant part of the makeup of an atom. His work suggested that atoms were more than just solid spheres of matter. It wasn't until almost a century after Dalton's publications that the first subatomic particle was finally discovered, the electron. In 1897, an English physicist called Joseph John Thompson published work where he investigated cathode rays, which were of interest to scientists at the time. These were beautiful green fluorescent beams that were made by creating a potential difference between two electrodes that had been sealed in a vacuum tube. There was a debate in the scientific community as to what these rays actually were. Some thought that they were waves as they traveled in straight lines and were unaffected by gravity. Others thought they were charged particles as they could be deflected by a magnetic field. In Thomson's publication, he described what happened as follows. At high exhaustions, meaning very low pressure, the rays were deflected when the two aluminium plates were connected with the terminals of a battery of small storage cells. The rays were depressed when the upper plate was connected to the negative pole of the battery, the lower with the positive, and raised when the upper plate was connected with the positive, the lower with the negative pole. Thompson demonstrated for the first time that cathode rays could be deflected by an electric field, and not only that, with similar experiments, he was able to show that these deflected rays could charge up the electrodes that they landed on. Thus, he was able to confirm that they consisted of electrically charged particles. And, because the cathode rays were attracted to the positive electrode, it meant that the particles must be negatively charged. He also demonstrated that the deflection of cathode rays was exactly the same even if there were different gases present in the tube or if different materials were used for the electrodes. This suggested that the negatively charged particles were identical in all these different substances. The most interesting part of all of this, though, was Thomson's estimates for the size of these particles. By measuring the radius of the curved path of the cathode rays and the amount of heat they transferred to the electrodes, he was able to use some very elegant calculations to show that the particles were around a thousand times lighter than the hydrogen atom, which, up until that time, was thought to be the smallest unit of matter. Thomson called these tiny, negatively charged particles corpuscles, but they soon became known as electrons within the scientific community. In 1904, Thomson published more work where he determined what the atom must look like if it includes these tiny, negatively charged particles. He described a model whereby negative electrons are embedded within a larger matrix which must be positively charged since atoms are neutral overall. This model became known as the plum pudding model, with the plums representing the electrons and the rest of the pudding representing the positively charged matrix. This plum pudding model is quite famous nowadays and is often taught in school. However, not many people realize that in this same paper, Thomson also put forward the notion that the electrons could be moving in orbits within the positive matrix. He used a lot of maths to determine this, accounting for all the electrostatic attractions and repulsions involved, and he described his idea as follows. We have thus, in the first place, a sphere of uniform positive electrification, and inside this sphere, a number of corpuscles arranged in a series of parallel rings, the number of the corpuscles in a ring varying from ring to ring. Each corpuscle is traveling at a high speed round the circumference of the ring in which it is situated, and the rings are so arranged that those which contain a large number of corpuscles are near the surface of the sphere, while those in which there are a smaller number of corpuscles are more in the inside, Later, he even describes how, rather than two-dimensional rings, the electrons could move in three-dimensional shells, saying, When the corpuscles are not constrained to one plane, but can move about in all directions, they will arrange themselves in a series of concentric shells. For some reason, the idea of electron shells isn't commonly attributed to Thomson, probably because when you hear plum pudding model, you don't tend to think about the plums whizzing around inside the pudding. But it's right there in his 1904 paper. Two years later, in 1906, Thomson was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics for his work. 
Thomson was the first person to provide evidence that the atom was more complicated than Dalton originally thought. 